Well, good morning, everybody. How many of you remember where you were on 9-11 20 years ago? It's, um, if you were alive, you'll never forget that day, and our lives were forever changed, but uh, hasn't God been faithful and good to us um, over the last 20 years? And just he just proved himself faithful once again, and, and whenever this time happens, actually 9-11 um, is Becky's birthday, and so it's, it's like the whole world stops, and, uh, but there is some good that happened on that day, but, um, but it, it's, a, it's a time when we remember those who've lost and, and, and just remember the great uh, sacrifice of so many, uh, you know, heroes were born in a day on that day, and so always want to recognize and remember um, those, those families and those people. Um, just, just a couple of things, as, as Bryce mentioned, we've got small groups starting tonight. And just a, a couple things that he didn't mention, uh, you can actually, those of you watching online, you can go online and register for groups. Um, has the description of the groups there. Also, those who are watching online, we actually are starting tonight a, an online, a Zoom small group. And so if you say, I don't think I want to get out of the house, I don't feel comfortable being close to people, whatever it is, uh, we, we have taken away your excuse, and now we have a Zoom small group. Uh, it's going to be sermon-based, so you watch the sermon today, and then you can put it into action tonight, and because we're not just going to be hearers of the Word, but we want to be what? Doers of the Word. And so, also, there was a, a typo on there. Uh, my group tonight is at 5.30, so I think somewhere it might have said Friday at 5.30, but it's tonight at 5.30, and so I invite you to come out. If you don't have a group, you can come to mine, um, and we'll have a, have a good time right here at the church. Uh, also, I just want to give you an update. Uh, last week, uh, we, we gave you the opportunity to give to Convoy of Hope to help those in Louisiana and Tennessee who are struggling from the, uh, the natural disasters that came through, the hurricanes and, and these storms that came through, and, uh, and you gave over $1,000 this week just to Convoy of Hope. So can, give yourself a hand for that. Um, one other thing before we dive into the message, I just want to ask you to continue to pray. Um, we've been praying for Pastor Tyrone Paul from South Africa, um, a good friend of our church, just um, love this guy. He's like a brother to me. Um, and last, this time last week, he was doing well, um, doing better anyway. He was stable, doing better. Had a turn for the worse this week. Actually, he is currently on a vent, and he is on dialysis. Um, but he is stable, and again, he's improving. But can we just pause for a moment and join people around the world and just pray for this brother uh, right now? Got a beautiful family. He oversees about 100 churches there in South Africa. Loves you, even though you may not know him. He loves our church and loves us. So can we just all lift up Pastor Tyrone right now? Father God, we just come to you. For uh, Tyrone, God, I just pray uh, your healing power. God, nothing is too hard for you. And God, as we've heard about your faithfulness and we've seen what you can do, God, we know that, um, God, this is an easy thing for you. And God, what's impossible with man is not with you. And God, we just pray that you speak the word and, and, and speak healing to his body. God, we pray that there wouldn't be any effects of this virus, any, any after effects of this, God, but you would just heal him completely. God, we lift up every family today that's suffering from COVID, those who are currently sick or those who are still recovering or those who've lost loved ones. God, we lift them all up to you. And God, we're praying, God, that you just show yourself strong and mighty on their behalf. God, give us wisdom and strength as we go through this pandemic. God, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. amen. If you would open your Bibles this morning to Acts 11, we're in a series. Uh, if you're visiting today, we're so glad you're here. Uh, we started a series in the book of Acts uh, a few months back. And we've been, we started in Acts 1, we've made it all the way to uh, Acts 11, we're at the end of Acts 11, and we're just going to look at uh, about four verses today and finish up Acts chapter 11. And we've been on this journey of seeing the, the church in its earliest state, uh, what, it, what it looked like, uh, the way Jesus founded it before we messed it up uh, through the years, and uh, it was a church that was on mission it was a church full of power. Uh, it was a church where people were getting saved uh, every day. People were getting saved, baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit. God was con continued to do miracles through uh, the apostles and through the early church. And, and what we have seen now is that the gospel has not only gone to the Jewish people, but now it has gone to this place called Antioch. 
and the gospel is now reaching everybody, not just Jews, but also Gentiles. Everybody is hearing the gospel, and, uh, and this church at Antioch is kicking. It started as a small group on a mission, and now this is a, a large, thriving church by the time we get to the end of Acts chapter 11. It was a quick work that God did. And so let's pick up there, Acts eleven twenty seven. and it says, And in these days prophets uh, came from Jerusalem to Antioch. And then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. And then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. I want to talk this morning about how to respond to bad news. Um, that's, that's bad news, isn't it? I mean, you know, things are going good, church is kicking, people are getting saved, uh, revival is breaking out, and then this prophet uh, comes down. Some prophets come down from Jerusalem and have to spoil the party. Uh, they show up with bad news. Y'all ever get bad news in your house? All you got to do is turn on the news in the morning and you can get some bad news. You don't have to wait very long. It's, it's there waiting for you when you get up. Um, but there's, there's bad news, and he shows by the Spirit that there's a famine that's going to affect the whole world. How many know if it's going to affect the whole world, that means it's going to affect you too? And, and these Christians weren't exempt from that. And, and so they were getting this big, great batch of bad news, but I, I want to really look today at, at two things. I want to look at the role of the prophet in the New Testament church, because that's something that may be new to many of us. We don't maybe hear about that in church a lot today, but also uh, how they responded to the bad news of the prophet because the prophet doesn't always bring good news. That's what we want. We want them to always give us good news, but sometimes the, the reality is the Holy Spirit says, guys, you better get ready, get ready because there's, there's some trouble on the way, and then we need to know how to respond to that trouble. So in this passage, in just these few short verses, we're introduced to the New Testament prophet. Um, and so they were, they were people that we just saw that through the power of the Holy Spirit were able to reveal what God knew. So they, they were in tune with God in a way that they were able to have revelation, if you will. They, through, through the Holy Spirit, it's not, not some special power they have. It's the Holy Spirit chose them to reveal something to them that only God knew. And then when they spoke it to everybody else, that's what makes them a prophet, is when they, they speak revelation to people of what only God knew. And, and prophecy doesn't always have to be future-related. It just means it's what's got on God's heart right then. So it could be something that, here's what God's feeling right now, and he just, he just shares it by the Holy Spirit, and then somebody else says, here's what God is feeling right now. Um, or it could be a future event. How many of you know God knows the future? He already knows what's going to happen tomorrow and the next day and next week. And so he could choose to let us in on what's going to happen. And a lot of times that's what we think about when we think of prophecy. We think about like Daniel and the dreams that he had and, or the book of Revelation where God is already telling us here's what's going to happen in the future. And so that would be considered prophecy as well. But it's, it's really just a revelation from God through a person. And, and what I want you to see is that New Testament prophets are different than Old Testament prophets. Old Testament prophets, if you remember, um, there was one mediator between the people and God in the Old Testament, and that was the prophet. And so if God wanted to speak to the people, uh, remember, they didn't have Bibles, right? Your Bible wasn't written yet. They didn't have Bibles. The people didn't have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them. Jesus, Jesus hadn't come yet. And so he chose to work through men and give them a word and say, okay, here's the word of the Lord for the people. And so this prophet would get along with God. God would give him a word. And then the the prophet would come before the people and say, thus saith the Lord. Here's what God said. Now, and and then he also had the job of following up like, okay, and here's what you need to do. So he kind of did everything. He heard from God. He spoke the word of God. And then he made sure that they did what God said. So that was the Old Testament prophet. But things are different today because, number one, um, we have Jesus as our mediator. There's one mediator between us and God, and his name is Jesus. 
right? We don't have to go to the prophet to find out what God has to say. We can go directly to God himself. Isn't that good news? That, that, that's good news. And so um, the second thing is we all have access to the written word. I mean, if you don't have one with you today, um, I encourage you to bring it with you today just to check me. Make sure I'm telling you the truth every now and then, but, uh, or that that screen is right back there. Um, but also, you know, everybody has access to a Bible today. If you don't own one, you can, they're cheap. You can get one. You can even get them free online. They're, they're, they're available everywhere. Everybody has access to the Word of God. You don't have to have a prophet to tell you what God said. Right? The third thing is that all believers, if you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. You have the same Holy Spirit that that prophet has, okay? So you can hear from God for yourself. In fact, that's my goal for each of you as your pastor is to help you have your own relationship with God so that you can hear from God for yourself. In fact, remember what Jesus said, my sheep, they know my voice and they won't follow another. So, so the, the role of the prophet in the New Testament is different, but, but notice here in book of Acts, there were still prophets, so, there, so if, if they didn't do what they did in the Old Testament, what is the role of these prophets? Well, God would use prophets in the New Testament who flowed in the prophetic um, to help to strengthen and give direction to the church. So just, just special people that God, God set aside for this thing. In fact, look at 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3. And, and, and while you're turning there, um, just so you know that Every one of you can prophesy because the God said in the last days he'll pour out in his spirit on all flesh and in sons and daughters and men and maidservants and everybody can prophesy. You all have the ability to prophesy because you all have the Holy Spirit in you. If you have the Holy Spirit in you, that means you can all hear from God and speak what he says. That's prophecy. But not everybody who prophesies is a prophet, right? The prophets were people that were set aside uh, for that specific uh, calling and purpose. So notice this in 1 Corinthians 14, 3. This is the primary purpose of prophecy in the New Testament. He says, But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, their encouraging, and their comfort. So, so they're a gift to the church to, to help strengthen the church. And, and oftentimes, and to comfort you and to to help you because oftentimes what they're doing is they're actually confirming or affirming what God has already told you, right? So, so if someone comes up to you and they, they say, hey, I'm a prophet, and, and they say, you know, the Lord told me that um, you're not supposed to marry her, you're supposed to marry that woman, and, and you guys are going are, are to spend the rest of your life in Africa. Well, listen, if God has never told you about that woman and Africa has never even been on your mind I wouldn't leave her and I wouldn't go buy a passport. I'm just telling you. I, I would, I'd put that one on the shelf and say, well, you know, it's interesting that God told you that. I mean, I'm his kid. Maybe he could tell me that. And, and, then, and then when I hear that. So, so just kind of put that one on the shelf. And, and then if God starts talking to you that way, then, then, hey, you have a confirmation. But... Most of the time in the New Testament, it's to confirm something. A personal prophetic word is to confirm something that you're already sensing, you're already feeling, but maybe you're scared to do it. That, that's happened to me uh, on more than one occasion. Years ago, we were um, still downtown. We were in the little building downtown, and um, the building was filling up, and we realized we needed to make a move, but we didn't have enough money to make a move. This building was the Eagles Club. They had been shut down. We, we wanted it, but it was going to be a major project. And, um, but we sensed this was where we were supposed to be. And so there was all kinds of insecurity, fear. Uh, this was a giant step of faith for us as a church. And so we, we kind of made the deal. We, we, we said, yes, we want it. Now we had to figure out how to get the money and all these things. And I'm wondering, have we made the right decision? I mean, people are saying, are you sure y'all want the Eagles Club? I mean, if you ever saw it, you would know why they said that. <laughs> because it, it didn't look anything like this, I'll just tell you that. And so, so there was a whole lot of insecurity, fear. Well, then the, all this happened within a week. Um, we get a letter from the IRS that the per person we were renting our previous church building from uh, hadn't paid taxes on that in forever. And, and so they were like putting a lien on the property. 
And so that wasn't good. It's, it's not good when they're like, we don't even know if we're going to get to have church there. And then the building next door where we were having Sunday school, all this happened the same week, actually collapsed. The, the, you remember that, right? The, the roof fell in the, the Sunday school building. And so we're like, I, maybe God's speaking to us here. I mean, this is all happening in a week. So, so then I show up at this church service, and someone tells me, hey, there's going to be a prophet there. And I was like, yeah, we'll see. So anyway, I, I show up, and, and we're there. And I'm telling the pastor there, I'm like, man, here's what's going on. You know, we're, we're we just signed on this deal, and our building fell in, and we're trying to hear if it's from God, you know, just I think it is, but, you know, generally when I think I've heard from God, I'm about 90%. I know y'all think I'm really spiritual, but generally it's about 90%. There's still a 10% chance that I missed it, right? And so I'm about 90% sure we're in this service, and, and the guy who's the, the prophet um, comes in, and he's like 30 minutes late. So, and he just rolls in, like nothing you've ever seen, and he, he just rolls in, goes up, grabs a microphone, points at me, tells me to stand up, and I'm like, here we go. Now, if y'all know me, I don't want to be the center of attention. I'm like, is he going to blow on me? Is he going to push me down? What's he going to do? He, and, and he just looks at me, and he says, he says, I see buildings crumbling. And I'm like, well, he just read my mail. And, and then he said, he said, and he said, I don't know you. He said, but I see real estate, and I see buildings, and he said, not just one building. He said, you're going to have multiple buildings. In fact, he said, you're always going to be in buildings. He said, it's just like, and I was like, man, now looking back, obviously he read my mail, but we've been in a building project just about ever since we've been here. I'm about to start another one, and so we're, we're in one now. We're meeting with the architect and doing those things. But, but listen, I'm just telling you, it was, if he did, if he'd have said that five years from before, it would have made no sense to me, but when, when he read my mail, it just confirmed that, okay, I think we've heard from the Lord. You know, I went from 90% to 100%, and it was just that, that the work of the prophet to confirm something that, that I already felt. But in this sense, it was he was showing them something that would happen in the future. He actually is predicting a worldwide famine. This Agabus is, he comes down, predicts that, hey, there's going to be a famine. It's going to affect all of you. And, and the best I can tell from this is that God wanted to prepare them for what was coming so that they would be prepared. But also, if you notice the response, they sent relief to people back in Jerusalem. If you remember, Jerusalem has been persecuted. There are already people have lost their jobs because they're Christians. And, and God was concerned about them. And, and God wanted to make sure they were taken care of, so he sends a prophet to says, hey, famine is on the way. Um, your brothers are going to be hurting up there. And so God already knew it was going to happen, so he began the process in place to take care of them even before it happened. Yeah. Isn't that awesome to know that God is already working on your behalf? And you don't, you don't see the answer yet, but God is already moving behind the scenes to take care of you. He's already working the details out for he's gonna, how, how he's going to do it. And, and so he came to encourage them with that prophetic word of something that would happen in the future. You know, that was before UPS. It was before, it was before the U.S. Postal Service. They couldn't just overnight something and get it there. It would take weeks, you know, to get it from where they were to where it needed to be. And so by the time they got there, can you imagine the truck showing up and then all of a sudden famine starts and then here they come up the road and they know they left weeks before? Come on, that's just, that's an awesome God. And when we open ourselves up to a supernatural God, then he can do supernatural things. Um, as we remember 9-11, um, uh, there's a church that I've always admired, always liked, called Times Square Church in New York City. It was started by a man named David Wilkerson, who I've always respected. He's gone on to be with the Lord now. But, um, and then at that time when 9-11 happened, that in 2000, uh, what was it, 2001? Uh, in 2001, Dave Wilkerson was the founding pastor, and there was this other pastor named Carter Conlon. And I followed both of them. I'd listen to them every week and everything. But what was amazing was six weeks before 9-11, and I remember this, six weeks before 9-11, it was like everything changed in that church. And, there, and Dave Wilkerson was very prophetic. He, he wrote some books that you read them today, and it's like, wow, this guy saw what God was way before his time. And, and so, but what happened is six weeks before, they began to sense 
that something was about to happen. And God gave them one word, and that word was calamity. That was it, just calamity. And so Dave Wilkerson, Carter Conlon, they come, and they had like a men's conference scheduled that, that month. They had a women's conference, and they shut everything down. They said, we're not traveling. We're just praying. And for six weeks, everything was prayer meeting. They said people would walk into the building, and there are thousands of people there, and they'd walk in. It was just like silence, just the solemnness of we don't know what's about to happen, but something's about to happen. And then six weeks later, 9-11 happens right there, and they're in Times Square right there in Manhattan, just blocks from uh, the World Trade Center. So when it happened, the plane hits the tower, people from the church ran to the church and started to pray. Carter Conlon walks in and says, get up, get up, come on, this is what we've been praying for. Don't you get it? God has prepared us. Everybody else is caught off guard. We knew something was coming. Come on. And they were the first people, first responders to bring water, uh, uh, dry socks for the firemen, uh, food. They were there. They set up camp. They opened up their church. And, and as people began to flood to the church, they were ready to counsel, to help, to minister. Where everybody else is fleeing the city, they're fleeing to the scene. And, and they responded to bad news. The World Trade Centers have fallen. We've been attacked. They responded to bad news with good news because they were prepared because they had this prophetic word. Do you all see the, where I'm headed here? And that, that's, that's a beautiful example of the gift of prophecy to the church. And, um, and when it's done right and when it's done well, it's a beautiful gift. Uh, when it's not done well, uh, it can actually bring more harm than good. Um, you know, as I look back um, over last year, it seemed like last year, 2020, was the year of the prophets. Um, there was election prophecies by the dozen. I don't know if y'all heard any, but people sent them to me every week. You know, have you heard this one yet? You know, and it, it was just every week someone was sending me an election prophecy uh, by the dozen, many of which did not come to pass. Um, and so when things like that happen as a pastor, I feel like I need to respond biblically because the tendency will be to throw out the baby with the bathwater and say, well, you know, well, prophets must not exist or prophecy, that must not be anything. And, and, and I've just told you about a situation, a real deal that happened uh, for me, for Times Square Church. Um, there's the real deal. And then, and then here's the thing we always have to remember is that prophets are people, and people are fallible. I don't care how big their platform, how big their church is, how many followers they have, they're fallible. And if you ever forget that people are fallible, I promise you, you'll be disappointed. And so if you just always remember that, and that's why I say that if somebody ever prophesies something to you, just kind of like put it on the shelf and then take it to God and say, I need to hear from God for myself. You know, if I want to tell my son David something, I'll tell him myself. I don't need Billy to tell him, right? <laughs> now, if I tell Billy, hey, go tell David this, and then David comes to me later and says, Billy told me that. Is that right? And I say, yeah, I told Billy, <laughs> right? You know, but he's going to confirm that, I promise. So I anyway, but it's, you need to get that from God yourself. And, and what happened, I think, um, you know, one of the ways that you know the prophecy is real is, is when it comes to pass or doesn't come to pass. That's the thing about Agabus. Look back at this in Acts eleven twenty seven. 27. It says, prophets came. Agabus stands up, shows by the Spirit there's going to be a famine throughout all the world. And then notice these words, which also happened. It happened. Can I just tell you, if God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And if a prophet says that God said it's going to happen and it doesn't happen, don't go blaming God. That just means the prophet missed it. Because they're fallible. They're people, just like I can miss it, right? And, and so, in, in my opinion, um, what happened last year is many, Old Test or many prophets took on the role of an Old Testament prophet. And that's not what God has called us to do. That's not what God has called anybody to do during this time. And what I think happened is many people saw the way the country was headed, saw the way the world was headed, and they began to prophesy things out of their own heart that they wanted to see happen. And they really believed that God was saying it. Listen, they believed it was God. They were just sincerely wrong. And so, so look at what it says in Ezekiel 13 too. 
Um, Son of man, this is what God is telling Ezekiel. Watch this. Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who prophesy and say to those who what? Prophesy out of their own heart. Hear the word of the Lord. See, see here's the thing is that it, sometimes we, we confuse God's voice with our own head and our own heart. And it's, it's why we have to be very careful. We have to set things up in our lives. In fact, notice, uh, because the Bible says the heart is deceitful. <laughs> you know, we, we can deceive ourselves even. Look at Jeremiah 23, 16. It says, thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. And, and so, listen, just because someone prophesies something doesn't mean it's from the Lord. We, we have to get alone in your own prayer closet and say, God, here's what the word was spoken. Now, God, is that what you're saying? And, and in the New Testament, there, there was um, um, always a team in the Old Testament, it was kind of like the prophet was the lone ranger, one man against everybody. In the New Testament, the prophet is part of a team of other ministers, other people. Um, and, and so we have to be careful, you know, again, not to discard prophecies, but to let, let's look at what it's supposed to, how it's supposed to function in the New Testament. Um, I remember when all this was going on and and, and, and a lot of the prophecies that were going out, people would send me, and I said, that's just not what I'm sensing. I just don't feel like that's what the Lord is saying right now. And so, but I have other people in my life. One of those was Pastor uh, Michael Durso. I called him, and I said, man, what are you sensing? I called uh, Pastor Tim Delina, who's the pastor of Times Square Church now. I talked to Pastor Tim, and I said, here's what I'm hearing. And, and he told me, and I, I was getting a little frustrated with all the prophecies, and he said, he reminded me of 1 Thessalonians 5.20. He said, don't despise prophecies. But test all things, hold fast to what is good. In, in, in Kentucky terms, it's like eat the meat and spit out the bones. It's, it's like, you know, hold on to the good stuff and the stuff that don't line up with the word or it isn't lining up with what God is saying to you, then just, just put that on the shelf for a while. Just, just hold, hold, hold on to the good, but, but it's okay to test everything. And in the New Testament, um, prophets run along the other side, the other offices of the ministry to help hold them accountable. And what happened in 2020 is not only were they bringing the prophecy, but they were also given direction. Okay, now here's what you need to do. And they, they started ro running outside of their lane. If, if you can think about um, being a, a prophet, being part of a team, it's kind of like on a, on a naval submarine. All right, you, you have all these different roles and all these different people. If you can imagine the guy, and I mean, forgive me for not knowing all my military terms, but the, the guy who's looking at the periscope and he's watching the screen and, and he sees something off in a distance and he's the seer. He sees what nobody else can see. And he's like, hey guys, we got a problem up ahead, right? That's his role. And then the admiral or the captain or whoever is going, to, is going to take that information and then determine what to do with the ship to navigate the ship. Does that make sense? He, he's an important part. He saw something that nobody else saw, but he doesn't then take over and start to say, okay, now here's what we need to do, everybody. They'd be looking at him, you ain't the captain of the ship. Go back to your periscope and, and, and tell us what else is on the horizon. Are you all with me? In the New Testament, look at Ephesians 4. I want you to see this. And, and, and the reason I'm doing this today is because I don't know of anything going on today. Nobody can be offended about anything. This is last year. I'm just, I'm just responding as we go through the book of Acts. I don't know of any of this stuff going on right now, but I want to prepare you for the next time it happens. Okay, so Ephesians 4 says he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. See, there's a team of people there. So, so when I heard what some prophets were saying, what did I do? I went to people that have an apostolic covering in my life. I went to Michael Durso. I, I went to Dale Yurton. I went to Al Toledo. I talked to Pastor Tim Delina. I ran these things through the filter of this apostolic covering that I have in my life. And, and they're like, that's not what I'm sensing the Lord is doing. So I felt safe by not jumping on that same lane. Here's something that I was taught a long time ago. The, the five-fold ministry is that apostles were given to the church to govern, 
to govern, prophets to guide, I see something coming, uh, evangelists to gather, pastors like me to guard, to protect the church, and teachers, which a lot of times pastors and teachers flow together, but it's to ground, to establish you, to get you in the word of God for yourself so that you're not blown around by every wind of doctrine that comes along. And so when we all function in our roles, then the church is edified, the church is built up. Um, you know, there's different people, there's different roles. Not, not only did we see uh, in, in 2020, I believe, pa- uh, prophets getting out of their role, uh, but we also pastors saw pastors getting out of their role. Um, I, I, I just bring this up because when, when somebody does something very publicly, I don't mind calling them out on it. Uh, there was a pastor in Kentucky. Um, he, he had a series of dreams. Some of y'all sent me that too. You know, what do you think of this? And he, he started out the video and, and he said, I'm not, a, I'm not a prophet, I'm a pastor. And by the way, this video that he sent out has had over 1.1 million views. Many of them were some of y'all. And y'all sent them to me. And like, what do you think about this? Had these series of dreams. And earlier in the year, he had a dream that um, basically it looked like COVID-19. It was like, you know, people wearing masks, you know, it spread, people were sick, you know, all these things, hospitals filling up. And, and it seemed like that dream came to pass. So he had another dream. And when he had this dream, he's like, well, the first one happened. This must be God. So I'm, I'm going to warn everybody. So he goes on the internet. And in this dream, it was like, you know, buildings burning. Um, and he said by November of 2020, that there would be uh, uh, Russian troops in the U.S., there would be Chinese troops marching down in the U.S., and the U.N. would be here keeping everything calm. And he, he said, your money would be gone. It's, you know, all your money is gone. Um, you're, we're all going to be hiding out in our houses as these Russians and Chinese people are marching down. Did anybody hear that video other than me? Did y'all raise your hand? Don't let me up here by myself. Did y'all hear that? Okay. All right. So some of y'all sent it to me, and like, what do you think of that? So, um, when I saw it, I was like, well, that's scary, but I don't think that's going to happen. And then here, here was the problem. Um, first of all, and that made me think, no, I don't think this is going to happen. Here's the, one of the things he said. He said, I re-, he said, I'm well read. I read about 40 newspapers every day from around the world. Number one, who has time for that? But num- number two, <laughs> how many of you know if you read 40 newspapers every day from around the world, that's going to affect how you dream at night? That is going to affect your mind. I mean, if Taco Bell will affect your dream, I promise you 40 newspapers a day will affect your dream. And so what you put into your mind affects those things. And so, you know, again, he, all these things were in his mind. The second thing that he, he, didn't run it by, he didn't run it by anybody with any kind of apostolic authority in his life before he sent it out. The third thing is he didn't check with any of the real prophets Say, what do y'all think about this? Um, the other thing that got me, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. We're gonna get into how to respond to bad news, and it'll be quick. But his response after he gave his dream, he says, "Now here's what you need to do, everybody. First thing you need to do is you need to stockpile food because you're not gonna have enough to eat. You need to stockpile food. And now, now listen, this is a pastor. Second thing he says, you need to go buy you some guns and a lot of ammunition because you're not gonna be able to get ammunition." So, so, always good. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 third was you need to have alternate forms of currency. You need to have silver and gold. Now, now, listen, everybody. I don't have a problem with any of those things. If you're a prepper, prep. If you if you've got a, a whole basement full of food and you're ready for for Armageddon, then then listen. Uh, we don't. So we'll be at your house. All right. I mean, <laughs> um, that that's awesome. If, if if you have guns and ammunition, that's fine. You know, whatever. But can you imagine Paul or Jesus saying, hey, famine's coming, everybody. Can you imagine Agabus showing up at the church and saying, hey, guys, the Lord showed me there's a famine coming. You guys better stockpile food. Mm. You you guys guys better go get some extra swords. I mean, and and they're going to be like... Because how many know people get hangry when they get hungry? Listen, 
Does that sound like anything you would read in the New Testament? Does that sound like Jesus? Is that how they responded? When they heard there was a famine coming, what did they do? They became more generous and they said, my goodness, if famine's coming, they didn't even think about themselves. They thought, wow, how's it going to affect those people in Jerusalem? They're already hurting. We better take up an offering. You see, I'm just telling you, the, the way God thinks is so different than the way that we think. And, and we can get so caught up in responding the way that the world responds instead of a kingdom response that says, my goodness, didn't God feed Elijah with ravens? I, I, I mean, didn't, didn't he provide a widow to give him food? How many of you know if God can take care of the sparrows and the lilies that he can, can take care of his children and his people? I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't do things to to take care of ourselves, but let's not live in in a state of fear when we get bad news. We're we're the people of God. And so how do we respond to bad news? Here's three things real quick. First of all, choose faith over fear. Choose faith over fear. Notice this. This isn't a good prophecy in Acts 11. There's a famine coming. Um, And it was a step of faith for them to give away resources that they might just need. They're, They're going to get, famine is coming, which means it's going to affect them. And here they are giving away resources. How many know that took faith to give away resources, not knowing if in a few months they might need those very resources they're giving away. But what they did, they had this confidence that, that says that, that if I give it away, that God's going to take care of me. Look at this promise in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. It says, remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. Look down at verse 9. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. He says, he said, if you'll, he said, God's the one who gives you seed. If you'll sow it, he'll give you bread for food. If he gives it to you, then don't hold it with a tight grip. You can trust that he's going to take care of it. If he sees you being generous, then he'll be generous with you. But that takes faith. And and fear, faith says, if I trust God, God's going to take care of me. Fear says, i got to take care of me and mine. And, And we just have to be careful not to live in fear. Psalm 91, you can claim this one, he who dwells. In the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. Come on, and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. Come on, you, when, you, when bad news comes, it's like, yeah, I realize that the whole world is a mess. I get it, but God is my refuge. Come on, I have, I have a strength. I have a hope. I have a hiding place, and His name is Jesus. Here's the second thing. Respond to bad news by choosing generosity. Come on, choose generosity. It says, then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief. They they chose generosity in the midst of trial. Nobody forced them to. It was a choice. It says, each of them determined to send relief. In fact, that's what it says in 2 Corinthians 9. Verse 7, it says, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Right? It, it, it wasn't the prophet wasn't pressuring people to give because of a famine. He just laid it out there. Here's what's coming. And then there was just this spirit in the people that said, you know what? We're not going to live by fear. We're going to walk by faith. And we're going to choose to be generous. And, and we're just going to give it away. And we're going to trust. And let's see what God will do. You know, I just, and, and you just can't outgive God. Look at verse 8. It says, and God will generously provide all you need. And you will always have everything you need and plenty left over for what? To share with others. 
You know, the prosperity gospel is, you know, you know, give and you'll get more and get more and God wants you to be wealthy. Here, here's the, the biblical definition of generosity. If you give, God will bless you so you can bless others and, and give some more. That's the heart of God. And the reality is you can't outgive God. And I just want to encourage you as a church during 2020, you guys did choose generosity. And, um, and when others were locked up, you stepped up. And, and y'all started giving away and serving and giving away food like crazy and serving and, 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 you know, people stepping up to do online, make sure we could do online church. I mean, I'm just telling you, as a church, you really stepped up and, and, and chose generosity and God has blessed us that. Why, why do you think that every week we're seeing people saved and baptized? And why? It's because it's what we're seeing today is a harvest of what we did in 2020 because you stepped up and you didn't live in fear but you stepped out in faith, God is blessing us today for that. You know, just in a couple of weeks, we're going we're gonna to choose generosity. And I'm, I'm going to Monterey, Mexico to train 50 pastors and their wives. And we're helping to, to provide that conference. They can't afford it, but we're, our church is going to step up and help and to, to, to take care of their food and their, their hotel and, and, and to encourage them and train them so they can go back to their churches. We say, oh, man, we need that money for our building program. How many you know if we sow some seed in what God cares about? Then God will take care of us. Here's the third thing. When bad news comes, Becky, you can come. Just do what you can. Look, look what it says, Acts 11, 29, 30. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief. Just do what you can. We have to be careful about saying, you know what, the church needs to do something about this. And I want to say, well, who exactly are you referring to? Because the church is you. It's us, right? You know, who exactly are, you know, well, the church needs to take that somebody some food. Well, are you talking about the building? I mean, are you talking about the people? Because we're the church. And, and so, so often, or we can say, and I'm going, I'm going, I'm, I'm going, this is, should I go here? This is touchy water, but be careful when they say, the government needs to do this for me. The government needs to take care of my education. Now, I got a son going back into, into college. I would love it if he had free education. But how many of you know there is nothing free? That if, if, if the government's paying for it, all that means is that they, they don't make money. Y'all know that, right? They, they don't produce anything. All they have is what they receive. So they receive money, and then they distribute it out. So if the government gave it to you, they didn't really give it to you. Somebody else gave them, and you're, you're getting somebody else's money, right? Are y'all with me? So church kind of works like that too. Uh -huh. We only have what we receive, but what we receive, we can give, right? So when we have to be careful about saying somebody else should do something or an institution should do something and and we have to say oh listen what can i do each according to his ability you know god won't ask you to do more than you can do but he does expect a return on what he's given you great little story in matthew 25 about stewardship and you know stewardship isn't about protecting what you have. It's about multiplying what you've been given. God expects multiplication. When he gives us things, he gives us gifts, he gives us resources, he's looking for a return. You know, Matthew 25, there's the story where he gives the talents to the people. He gives one guy five talents, another two, and another one one. The guy with five goes and gets five more. You know the story. The guy with two goes and he doubles his talents. And then then the guy with one talent, because he was afraid, went and hid his talent in the ground. And then when the master comes back and he, he, he looks at the one he gave five, he said, hey, here's your five and here's five more. And the Lord, he's like, well done, good and faithful servant. You did good. He goes to the guy who get, he gave two and he said, here's, here's your two back and here's two more. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Then he goes to the guy who have one, has one. And the guy had actually buried it in the ground because he was afraid of losing it. And so when the master shows up, he goes and he digs it up, brings his talent. And he says, here's your money back, just like you gave it to me. 
Like I protected it. And that master said, you wicked and lazy servant. I didn't give it to you to hide it. I gave it to you to multiply it. Listen, we, we can't live in fear. Because of his fear, he hid what God gave him. We can't live in fear. This is a time for our light to shine. It's a time for our get to, to step out in faith and to use what God has given you. He's not going to ask you for more than what he's given you, but he is going to ask you to use what he has given you by faith and believe that God is going to multiply it. Amen? Come on, let's choose faith over fear. Let's choose generosity. And let's do what we can. Come on, stand to your feet this morning. Let's pray. Father God, as we remember 9-11, and God, my, my mind can't help but think of those brave men and women who, when other people were running out of the building, they were running toward the danger. They were running toward the flames. They did it afraid. They took courage. And they did it afraid. And God, I, as we see our nation crumbling, as we see the world um, in turmoil, God, I pray that the church of Jesus Christ would choose to do it afraid, would choose to be the light, would choose to run toward the darkness with a torch to run toward bad news with good news. God, that we won't hide out in our houses, but God, we will with courage share the good news of what you've done with the lost and dying world. God, give us courage. Give us boldness by your spirit. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, we're going to play one more song today. If you need prayer, you can come up. There's people that will pray with you. If you just want to come to these altars, you can. Listen, but most of all, just before you leave today, just ask the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today? And just let him speak to you and do what he says. Amen.